This is a long slide, you don't need to pay attention to it, but the, the role of higher education, or the, the role of uh, modern university, since this is a uh, higher education community, you are familiar with uh, it's a special place. In, uh, and its role also in the uh, empowerment of people and the development of, of nations. Uh, knowledge generation now uh, replaced ownership of capital assets, as you, as you know as a source of growth and prosperity. Uh, nations are, all of them are trying very hard now to create institutions and organizations that would facilitate the process of knowledge creation. And uh, knowledge creation requires, of course, universities. It requires a network of scholars actively engaged in its pursuit. Uh, and uh, the modern university is the natural place for that. The, just to give you some stats here about the state of uh, higher education in Libya. These are some numbers, might be a little bit outdated, maybe a year old or so. We have about 12 universities, uh, 16 technical colleges, 90 uh, high technical institutes, about 380 middle technical institutes. The technical institutes are also under the ministry, but they are under the national authority of technical and vocational education, which is part of the Ministry of Higher Education. There are roughly 5,000 students in the system, more than 400 at universities, and I think over 70 or 80,000 technical colleges and institutes, and roughly about 15,000 uh, studying abroad. That number also might be larger now. Uh, in my short talk in the morning, I did uh, mention some of the uh, issues with uh, uh, higher education in Libya now. Too many students, students not graduating on time for classroom, laboratory, and, and library facilities. Uh, no IT, uh, not even internet in many universities. Uh, poor staff appraisal system and insufficient staff. Lack of strategic perspectives and lack of national, international exposure. Uh, more problems. Random distribution of universities and colleges, scattered, uh, fragmented, uh, distorted uh, distribution of students with regard to fields of study. Uh, the QA is uh, very uh, modest also, QA standards and accreditation. It's kind of a de facto accreditation. If you are part of the government, you are accredited. Uh, total absence of Libyan universities from international or regional ranking is, uh, rankings, I'm sorry, and uh, insignificant research output. Very little comes out of, uh, of Libya in terms of uh, scholarly research. Uh, problems start, of course, at the elementary and secondary education. Also has its uh, own set of issues. There's a serious lack of autonomy and academic freedom. Uh, and the autonomy, even within the university, like uh, if you think, for example, of budgets and purchasing, even departments and colleges don't have uh, that decision. It, it, it's made at the central uh, university level. Uh, low levels of funding, and I'll talk about that. And uh, I, I Also, I like to think of it as stifling regulatory framework that really needs to be trashed. Uh, how do we fix it? It needs a serious reform. The public higher education, that is, through a master plan of higher education. Uh, we need to improve governance and the legal fr framework. And, and we need to increase funding seriously. And as I mentioned in the morning, we also need to establish a new and independent world-class university uh, on, on a clean slate and with international standards. Uh, the... There is, you know, all countries now uh, sort of uh, value uh, excellence in higher education and they are uh, trying very hard to have world-class universities and are competing for rankings. Uh, some have attained uh, that in record times, like China, India, Korea, South Korea, that is, and Singapore. 
Uh, some are in the way, Malaysia, Turkey, uh, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia to some extent. Uh, Libya has the resources, at least the financial resources, but lacks the national will, uh, at least until now, to develop a master strategic plan and allocate the required resources for this. We need to learn from successful experiences in other nations. And I think this uh, forum is an excellent opportunity for that. Uh, higher education is an integrated system. The way it is in Libya now, it's very fragmented and very uh, inconsistent. World-class university does not uh, exist in vacuum, but it's part of an integrated education system. National and, re and, and regional universities, colleges and institutions, and Dr. Fatih mentioned that we started thinking about that when we were in the government. Uh, elementary and secondary education also needs serious attention. That's the feed to uh, higher education. The characteristics of when we say world-class universities, what, what do we mean by that? Uh, it's uh, one definition, at least this is from a publication of, uh, by the World Bank. Uh, highly sought graduates, that uh, everybody competes for your graduates, that's one uh, important indicator. Leading edge research and, of course, uh, contribution to technology transfer. Uh, these uh, can be attributed to three complementary sets of factors. All of them actually, uh, and unfortunately, are lacking in the higher education as it exists in Libya today. One is, uh, which is very important, high concentration of talent, both in terms of faculty and, and students. And uh, a very important contributor to that is uh, international participation both in terms of students as well as in terms of faculty, which in Libya is very minimum. Abundant resources to offer rich learning environment and to conduct advanced research and favorable governance, uh, especially like to, to encourage strategic, strategic vision, uh, innovation, flexibility, and so on. Uh, there's too much bureaucracy nowadays in, in Libya. So these are the three uh, rings here that uh, uh, together uh, will, will produce a world-class university if, uh, if, if, if they uh, exist. Uh, Libyan uh, versus world-class universities, some data for comparison here. I'll mention a few things, only funding and enrollment. Uh, these are rankings, and if you don't see your university here, uh, that's okay because rankings do. Uh, change from year to year and also from one ranking system to another, but this is the uh, Shanghai ranking in 2008. It, uh, I just picked the top 20 universities here. The colors mean something here. The, all the black ones are private universities, all of them actually in the U.S. Uh, the green ones are U.S. public universities. The red ones are non-U.S., uh, two in this country, two in, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Tokyo. If you look at the, uh, another ranking like the uh, Times Higher Education Supplement, you'll, you'll find a different uh, list. Now, most of these universities, one feature that's common to all of them is that they have very large endowments. And these are some of the endowments of uh, some of those universities. The highest is, of course, Harvard at about 30 billion, and uh, Rice is about 5 billion or so. Uh, the expenditures at these universities and the number of students, these are the two things I would like to highlight. Just, if you look at the students, the largest one in this group is the University of California, Berkeley, which has about 30,000 students, and the smallest is Caltech, which has about 2,000 students. The expenditure per student in Berkeley is 51,000 per year per student, and in the case of Caltech, is one million per, per student. Of course, that's kind of anomaly there. But, but aside from Caltech, all of them are in the 50s, 60s, some of them hundreds. Uh, UK universities, I think, is uh, Cambridge is up there, it's 57, and Oxford is like 45,000 per year. And uh, other European countries, universities in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on. The lowest is. Germany, University of Munich, which is 22,000 per student, that's per student per year. If you look at Tripoli University at the bottom, 
which has, in terms of student numbers, we have 87,000, and this is like three year old statistics, and now the number is over 100,000. And we spend uh, in the budget of 2013, $2,500 per student. The number actually is smaller if I use the current uh, number of students, which is over 100,000. It will bring that number to probably below $2,000 per student per year. Compare that to other universities in the 20s and 50s and 100s and so on. So what do you expect? The, also the enrollment, which is uh, probably on a different slide here, yes. Look at the student enrollment at Libyan universities. The top two, which is Tripoli and Benghazi, Tripoli now exceeded 100,000, and Benghazi is approaching that. And the others also, the numbers are increasing. Uh, and and the, uh, the spend expenditures per student are very modest for all of them. The other thing, enrollment, which is a serious thing, and I said crowded and also the distribution is very distorted. And I picked one example here, which is medical education in Libya. This is from the American Association of Medical Colleges, 2012. And their projection for 2012 in all medical colleges in the US, which is, I think they have about 137 medical colleges, was under 20,000, uh, about 19,000 and a half, uh, the current colleges. This is the entering class. So if you multiply that by four, roughly, uh, or if you divide that by 137, you get about 125, 130 students enrolling in medical colleges every year. If you multiply that by four, because medical education is four years in the US, you're talking about on the average 500 to 600 students in the whole uh, college. In fact, these are some numbers here. Harvard is, uh, uh, where is it? No, this is, uh, this is the wrong slide. This is about student enrollment. Okay, here's the medical schools, yes. Harvard has like 700 students total, and, uh, and, and so on. So all the top schools, like under 500, Columbia, uh, 600. Washington, which is one of the biggest uh, medical schools and serves like four, five states, Washington, Alaska, uh, Wyoming, uh, Montana, and, and Idaho, has only 900 students, medical students. Now, if you look at Libya, the University of Tripoli alone has 16,000 medical students. Just crazy. I mean, the, the, the budget of the University of Washington Medical School is in the billions. Uh, so again, that's, that's a serious issue in terms of distribution and also the uh, corresponding uh, levels of, uh, of funding. It's very difficult to, to fix. It uh, does need uh, major uh, reform through, again, master plan and... Uh, uh, one example is, is California Master Plan. Uh, California in the 40s and 50s was also, uh, the higher education was kind of uh, chaotic there. But they did uh, fix it, and, uh, and now it's one of the best, probably, higher education systems. Uh, we need really to pull uh, our resources in for research universities, and only a few universities, rather, rather than scattering it all over the place. Uh, medical schools should be limited to only one or two universities in Libya, maybe, maybe three at the most, and uh, allocate enough resources to them and uh, pick only top students to enter them. Uh, so we do need uh, major investment. Uh, and uh, here where the legislatures could play uh, a very important role, and our uh, uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Metu uh, probably could address that at the National Congress level, is to, uh, this is something the U.S. did, and it transformed higher education in the U.S., not only in the U.S., actually in the world, in terms of engineering higher education, which is uh, the uh, Morrill Act in uh, 1862, which is known as the Land Grant Act. And what they did in that land grant is that the federal government, through an act of Congress, gave every state 120 kilometers of federal land, square kilometers of federal land, and those to be strictly used for developing institutions of higher education to teach what they called in those days useful science. 
At that time, liberal arts was kind of dominating in the U.S., and useful science was defined as agricultural sciences, uh, engineering sciences, and military sciences. And it did transform higher education, not again, not only in the U.S., but worldwide. Now, we have about 100 top universities are product of that act by one Congress member, uh, including MIT and Cornell. Both of them are land-grant universities, although they are kind of private universities. The, the, the other thing is endowments. We need to get the government out of it, give the money and get out. Just endow the money to those institutions and get out of it. And the, uh, the other thing is internationalization, which comes with autonomy. If the university can make its own decision, then it can recruit faculty, can recruit students from Libya, from outside, it doesn't matter, can recruit good management and so on. And establishing a world-class university. Thank you very much. Thank you.